Hi folks, this is my second lecture about equilibrium and today we are going to do um, a bunch more long equilibrium problems showing you some um, helpful tips along the way and a couple of more um, fun algebra things and then Le, Chatelier, Le Chatelier's principle and then um, how the equilibrium constant K is related to the Gibbs free energy um, G. All right, here we go. Um, in our last lecture, we saw the very first instance of using what we're calling an ice chart, um, which is, stands for ice is the initial concentrations or pressures, the change in those concentrations, and then the equilibrium uh, values for those concentrations. That helps you keep track of what the heck is going on, and it allows you enough of a brain that you'll be able to figure out how to do the algebra um, that comes up in each of these questions. Um, so when you are given your initial concentration values and then it asks you what your equilibrium values are, that's the kind of question that requires an ice chart. So here is our nice simple example um, in which we have given one mole of carbon monoxide and two moles of chlorine in a one liter flask. For this reaction, assuming that these are all gases, um, and the equilibrium constant is three. Um, this is on the back of the notes, so I'm gonna flip to my black screen where we've got that. All right, so given one mole of carbon monoxide and one mole of chlorine gas in a one liter flask, K is two, I had to just change that real quick, but it's two, and what are the equilibrium concentrations is your question. So we're gonna use our ice chart here. Um, our initial concentration for carbon monoxide is one mole in one liter, so that is one molar. And same deal for chlorine, you've got one mole of chlorine in one liter, so the concentration is one molar. And there is none of this mentioned, so that is zero molar. Um, then you've got the change which um, in order to know what the change is in this system, whether it's going to shift left or shift right, you have to think about it for a second. And when you do, you realize it can't shift left because you would be using up COCl2 and there isn't any. So it's got to shift right. That means that we're going to lose a little bit of carbon monoxide. We're going to lose a little bit of chlorine. And notice that it's the same amount because our mole ratio is one to one. So however much carbon monoxide we lose, we lose the same amount of chlorine. Um, and then we gain that same amount of um, COCl2. So our equilibrium concentrations are gonna be one minus X for carbon monoxide and one minus X for chlorine. Um, whereas for COCl2, you're going to just have a concentration of whatever X is. And now our job is to figure out what X is. Um, the way you do that is you use your equilibrium expression. So what we have is um, K is equal to, or equilibrium expression is as follows, COCl2 over CO times CL2. Um, and we know that that is two equals COCl2 has a value of X uh, CO has a value of 1 minus X, and Cl2 has a value of 1 minus X as well. Now you just have an algebra problem. So doing some algebra, you end up with 1 minus 2X plus X squared equals 2. So that's going to be 2 times 1 minus 2X plus X squared equals X, or um, 2x squared minus 4x plus 2 equals x, or 2x squared minus 5x plus 2 equals 0. Oop, we're running out of room. Um, and since we are all good algebra children, we know that we can separate this maybe back out into this kind of deal. So you've got 2x, factoring it I think is what this is called, 2x and x, um, and then that's going to be a 2 and a 1 here, and that's a negative I think, so that you get 2x squared minus 4x minus 1x plus 2. Yeah, beautiful. So that means that we've got two roots possible for our x, so our x ends up equaling when you've got 2x minus 1 equals 0, x can be a half, and if you've got x minus 2 equals 0, 
x can equal 2. So our x is either a half or 2. Um, and when you do these, uh, you do always get two roots for x pretty much, and um, one of them makes no sense. So let's go see which one doesn't make any sense. Um, if you look, we've got carbon monoxide that starts at one molar and loses some amount. It, it can either lose half or two. Frankly, starting at one, you can't lose two. So the two doesn't make sense, so the half is the correct answer for x. We're not done. Um, you have to go one minus x. Our carbon monoxide concentration is one minus x, which is equal to 0 0.5. Our chlorine concentration molar is equal to one minus x, which is also 0 0.5. And our COCl2 concentration is equal to x, which is also 0.5. We're all 0.5s. Nice. Um, and if you plug that back in to your equilibrium expression, you'll get 0.5 over 0.5 times 0.5, which is um, point five over point two five, which is two. Ding! Yay! It's two. Good. I was worried it was a half, um, and that's correct. So these are your equilibrium concentrations. Yay, algebra. Okay, next. Back to the notes. Um, so we did this example, algebra, continue the above. Okay, um, and now there are, there's another example that I'd like to do 13.10, which is in um, the packet of examples that I've given you uh, to go along with your notes. Um, so let's go look at that one. 13.10, here it is. Carbon monoxide reacts with steam to produce carbon dioxide and hydrogen. At 700 Kelvin, the equilibrium constant is 5.10. Calculate the equilibrium concentrations of all species if one mole of each component is mixed in a one liter flask. Cool. Okay, so our first step is to write out our reaction, which is carbon monoxide reacts with steam, which is a gas, by the way. Um, it wouldn't count if it was liquid water, to produce carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Um, these are all gases, and I think it's balanced. Yeah, it's already balanced. Um, at 700K, the equilibrium constant, and then we've got one mole of each mixed in a one liter flask. So we can make our ice chart underneath our balanced equation. And our initial concentrations of all of these is one mole in one liter, so they're all one molar. They're giving you pretty numbers to learn with. All right, and then our change, well, what is our change? The question is a good one because which way is it going? Is it gonna shift left or is it gonna shift right? Is it already at equilibrium? We've gotta do our um, K versus Q deal. So for Q, um, our first step is left or right, and that's gonna involve Q. So Q, set up your equilibrium expression with a bunch of ones in it. That's going to be um, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and water. And that's going to be 1 times 1 over 1 times 1. That's 1. So Q is 1 and K is 5.10. So that's Q is greater than K. Q is greater than K. Yeah, sorry guys. That's not true. <laughs> Q is less than K. 1 is less than 5.1. Q is less than K. 1 is less than 5.1. Um, and this is indicating that it is shifting to the right. Um, and the way that I remember that, which is bizarre but may help you, is that this is a little alligator. Hello, I'm an alligator. <clears throat> I'm a shark. Um, I know you are. And when you've got Q and K and the little alligator, the direction that it will go is the direction that the alligator vomits. So if you've got Q is less than K, it's vomiting stuff to the right. Um, <laughs> that's not an alligator. Um, it's vomiting stuff to the right, and so that means it's shifting to the right. Sort of weird, I know, but it makes you think about alligators at least. So it's going right. <sighs> that means that you can go carbon monoxide loses some. 
uh, you lose some steam, you gain some carbon dioxide, and you gain some hydrogen. So that's 1 minus x, 1 minus x, 1 plus x, and 1 plus x. Um, so now, stetch, stetch, step and stage 2, um, you use your equilibrium expression with all the things plugged in. So 5.1 equals um, 1 plus x times 1 plus x over 1 minus x, 1 minus x, and here we have a nice little um, <clears throat> uh, little algebra nightmare here, which if you remember your algebra goes something like this, 5.1 equals 1 plus, that's not plus, plus x squared over 1 minus x squared. You can take the square root of both sides which gives you 2.26 equals 1 plus x over 1 minus x. That's going to give you um, 2.26 minus 2.26 x equals 1 plus x. Collect your terms and you've got 1.26 equals 3.26 x divide by 3.26 and x gives you 0.39. Um, I didn't remember to do this square root thing the first time I did this question and so I ended up multiplying all these out and collecting all my terms and doing a whole lot of terribleness. Um, so it's helpful to notice that you can do the square root when you have uh, this kind of situation, situation uh, here. So x is 0 0.39 and then our last stage is to put uh, the x in so that you end up with carbon monoxide is um, 1 minus 0.39 uh, carbon monoxide is equal also to H2O is equal to 1 minus 0.39 which is um, 0 0.61 and our carbon dioxide which is equal to our hydrogen concentration is 1 plus 0.39 so 1.39 molar molar bam there are your answers for example 13.10. Alright, going back to our notes, um, we're going to skip 13.11 until class. Um, I think that one does pressures, which is pretty similar. Um, you may have noticed that uh, the last two examples have been nice pretty numbers, which doesn't always happen in real life. In fact, it's pretty contrived. Um, and so sometimes you end up with hard ones that have uh, terrible numbers that are not easy to factor by hand. If you remember back to your algebra class, the way that you handle that is you use the quadratic equation. Here it is. Um, hopefully you already have it memorized. If you don't, you need to have it memorized. Um, so that's when you're looking for x and you can't factor it to save your life, um, x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. Um, we're going to go do an example using the quadratic equation now. Yay, I'm thrilled. That's uh, the back of these notes, page two, which is down here is this one. But I've got it on my black pen screen as well. And it's over here, maybe? Yeah, it's over here, maybe. All right. Right? That's right. Is that right? Suppose, yes. Suppose for a synthesis of hydrogen fluoride from hydrogen and fluorine that 3 moles hydrogen and 6 moles fluorine are mixed in a 3 liter flask. Assume that K is at this temperature 115. Calculate the equilibrium concentration of each component. Alright, balanced equation. That's going to be hydrogen and fluorine giving you hydrogen fluoride. That's two of them. Your equilibrium expression is going to be HF squared over H and F. Um, and your ice chart is going to look like this. And let's see, we've got three moles of hydrogen in a three liter flask. Concentrations, that's going to be one molar. Uh, and six moles of fluorine in a three liter flask, that's going to be two molar. And we've got no 
hydrogen fluoride, which is nice because that means that it's real obvious which direction this one is shifting. It has to shift right. It can't shift left. Um, so that means we're going to lose some hydrogen and lose some fluorine. And here's the trick to this. Pay attention. Pay attention. Is that you're going to gain twice as much in terms of moles because of this two for hydrogen fluoride because you um, have got these. These are diatomic one to one to two. So if you lose one mole, you lose one mole, you gain two moles. All right, so that's going to be one minus x. 2 minus x, that looks like a y, and 2x. Um, plug it in, run the algebra, and use the quadratic equation. So that's going to be 115, which is your k, is 2x, and this is important, in parentheses, squared. 1 minus x and 2 minus x, um, and that's going to give you, do I have this one done? Yeah, okay. Um, that's going to give you this guy, 115 equals 4x squared. I always forget to square this number along with this x. That's silly and foolish. Don't do it. Um, 4x squared and 2 minus 3x plus x squared. Then that's going to give you 115, 2 minus 3x plus x squared equals 4x squared, and that's going to give you 230 minus 345x plus 115x squared. Do you see why you're not really going to be able to uh, factor this one easily? So that's going to give you 111x squared minus 345x plus 230, um, and that equals 0. So now we go and we use the quadratic equation. So x equals um, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. That's going to be negative, this being a, this is b, and this is c. Negative b, b is negative 345. Be aware of that. That's important. Um, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is negative 345 squared, which is going to be a positive number, be aware of that, times 4, ta minus 4 times 111 times 230. This is so long. I know. Don't worry. It gets longer. 2 times 111. That's going to give you x equals 345 plus or minus the square root of, when you do all this hoo-ha in here, you get 16,905 over 222. So that's going to give you x equals either 345 plus 130.01 over 222 or 345 minus 130.01 over 222. And that gives you either 2.14 or 0 0.968. Now, one of those doesn't make sense. That's going to be 2.14. It's too big. You can't have 1 minus 2.14 here. So this one makes sense. So we go and plug that into our numbers. That's hydrogen's concentration equals 1 minus 0.968, which is 0 0.052 molar and fluorine's concentration, which is 2 minus 0.968, which is 1.052 molar, and hydrogen fluoride's concentration, which is 2 times 0.968, which is 1.936 molar. Those are your answers. Whew. Now, you may have noticed that the quadratic equation is a pain to use. You may program it into your calculator. If you are careful and you program it correctly, then it makes it really a lot easier to do um, these problems and you don't have to sit and do all of this algebra. Now, you have to know how to do this algebra, but this makes it go faster. Um, I will coach you through typing this into your calculators in class at some point 
um, if you would like to give it a shot yourself, um, test these numbers that we just did. And if you get 2.139 and 0 0.968, then that means you've typed it in correctly and so your program is working. Ding! All right, going back to our notes. All right, um, that's the back of the notes. We're going to skip 13.12. All right, here's the last little thing about the algebra that makes it even worse. But not very much, only slightly. And then it also makes it better. Whatever. All right. Um, a sneaky trick that you can do. Sometimes the algebra gets bad enough that you're like, I'm never going to survive. Um, and one thing that you can do is occasionally you can just ditch an X, which is really nice because sometimes those X's gives you, give you like X cubes and stuff, which is really terrible. Um, you can ditch an X, but only if it's mathematically insignificant. So for example, if you've got something like uh, a concentration of 0.5 molar and you're losing a little bit of it, so minus 2x. If x is really, really teeny tiny, in this case 0.5 minus 0 0.0001, then you end up with 0 0.0, you end up with 0.499999. Mathematically speaking, that's not going to matter and your answers for your concentrations when you're done are within your significant figures, so you're fine. Um, your x is only really that small when your k is really small. So if you have a k, you've got to look for this. You have, if you have a k where it's e to the negative 5 or so, and it's quite small, then you are allowed to drop an x that is mathematically inconvenient. Um, and you do need to do this if your k expression is giving you cubes or something horrible. Um, if you do do this, at the end when you're done and you've got your answer for x, you have to go back and check and make sure that the x that you dropped from 0.5 minus 2x is less than 5% of this 0.5. Because if it's more than 5% of, you can't reasonably say, oh, it doesn't matter at all. So that's what one thing that you've got to do. And you have to write it down or I will count off. You have to go back and check. So this is a, a example 13.6 text. Um, these are all from the Zoomed All book, and this was the example in the text in seg section 13.6, which I have copied into your little packet. Here we go. So gaseous NOCl decomposes to form the gases NO and Cl2. At 35 degrees Celsius, the equilibrium constant is 1.6 E negative 5. In an experiment in which 1.0 moles of NOCl is placed in a 2.0 liter flask, what are the equilibrium concentrations? This is the small x problem that I was talking about. All right, gaseous NOCl decomposes to form this. Unbalancey balance and ice and Nice small K here. Mm -hmm. uh, one mole, two liter flask. That's important. One mole is placed in a two liter flask. That's 0 0.5. What are the equilibrium concentrations? And there's none of these. So that saves us the Q step. We don't have to go mess with Q because it's obvious that it's got to shift right. So we're going to lose two parts of this every time we gain two parts of this and gain one part of this. So this is 0 0.5 minus 2x, this is 2x, and this is x. And our equilibrium expression is as follows, NO squared, Cl2, and NOCl squared. You see that the algebra here is going to be a little bit more awful. So we've got 1.6e negative 5 equals NO, what's NO? 2x squared and x and NOCL squared, 0.5 minus 2x squared. All right, so this here is going to be terrible. Where is my, I've already written this out somewhere. 13.6 text. There it is. Okay, so this is going to cause problems and is something that one could consider ditching because mathematically speaking, if this x if this x is really small, that changes the value of this fraction pretty significantly because it's squaring and multiplying and stuff. 
Same thing here. If this x is really small, it's significant because it's changing the value of this fraction. This place for x, if it's really small, doesn't matter because you've got 0.5 minus 0.0001. Well, then you've got the top divided by 0.5 or 0.499999 squared. Not a big difference. If it's less than 5% of this 0.5, you can just go nee, 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 and change um, your equation to be like that. So 1.6 e negative 5 equals 2x squared. No, don't do that. 2x squared x 0.5 squared. That's going to be a lot better because then you don't have to do all of the collecting terms and x quadruples and it, it would be terrible. Um, so you end up with instead 1.6e negative 5 equals 4x cubed over 0.5 squared. Um, and that's going to give you, uh, moving this over, that's going to give you 4e to the negative 6 equals 4x cubed. Now it's pretty, isn't it? Cancel your 4s, 1e to the negative 6 equals x cubed. And um, actually, you can do this one in your head because with the negative 6 here, that's times, times, times. So that's going to be 1e to the negative 2 is the cube root. Now, here's the thing about the small x problems is you have to, once you have figured out your x and you've canceled it, you have to make sure that it's less than 5% of 0.5. So is it the case that you dropped off less than 5% of 0.5? Um, so what we did, we had 0.5 um, minus 2x where x is equal to 0.01. Um, and what you dropped off was 0 0.02. So 0 0.02 out of 0 0.5 times 100, you end up with 4%. That is less than 5%. I always draw a cloud around this, and I would recommend that you do the same because it has to be present. It does not count as correct if you don't do this check. And putting it in a cloud means that I'll be able to find it. And me finding it means I won't take off a point by being um, lost cloud. I recommend it. So this is my check, 4%. We're good to go. Check. That means I can do this. I'm permitted to do this. My x is 0 0.01. That means I can go back up here and find my equilibrium concentrations. Um, and that's going to be um, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, and 0.48. Whee! All right. So there's that one. Okay, that is as bad as the algebra gets in this unit. All right, Le Chatelier's principle. Um, Le Chatelier's principle is um, the answer to the question, what happens if you do something to the system? Is it going to shift left, right, or nothing? Um, and Le Chatelier's principle is as follows. If a change is done to a system that's at equilibrium, the system sh will shift in the direction that counteracts that change. So if I start pushing on the left, it will counter that. If I start pushing on the right, it will counter that. So let me give you sort of an example of this. Um, here we've got my nice little um, flask with an equilibrium system of um, uh, the synthesis of ammonia. You've got nitrogen, you've got one, two, molecules of nitrogen, you've got one, two molecules of hydrogen, and you've got four molecules of ammonia in the system that's at equilibrium. Coincidentally, in case you were wondering, this is important later, um, this is an exothermic reaction in this direction. Um, so the question is, what would happen if you added nitrogen to this system, if you put in more reactant? Well, if you put in more reactant, you're increasing the concentration of that reactant. Um, and it's going to have to, because you've got to keep your equilibrium constant the same, it's going to have to kind of go and react a little bit to fix the numbers so that your equilibrium constant stays the same. Adding nitrogen gives you too much reactant, which makes your bottom too big. 
um, in order to keep your K the same. So if your bottom is too big, you've got to decrease your bottom and increase your top a little bit. So it's going to um, shift to the right in order to counteract the fact that you put some nitrogen in. So adding reactant forces it to shift right. So, um, and I'm gonna see if I can get my pen to work. Mm, it's not working, hang on. So adding the nitrogen shifts it to the right. Shifts right. Hmm. All right, adding ammonia. If you added ammonia to this, you would be adding um, too much product. Product is on the top of our equilibrium expression, and that's going to make your K too big. So in order for it to shift so that the K stays the same, because it's an equilibrium constant, you're going to have to shift away from that product and add some more reactant, so decomposing this. So if you're adding a product, it's got to shift left. Um, so you see what this means. If a change is done to a system, the system shifts in the direction that counteracts the change. So adding stuff on the left makes it shift right. Adding stuff on the right makes it shift left. It's like you're kicking it. Um, all right. Um, so those are adding reactants and adding products. Um, other thing that's interesting is that, you know, up until now we've been considering a system that's always at the same temperature because your K is constant at the same temperature. Now, what if you changed the temperature? Um, what does that do to your equilibrium? Well, it depends on if it is an exothermic or an endothermic reaction. Um, and the best way to think of this is to consider energy as though it were a reactant or a product. So in this case, this is exothermic. That means that energy is coming out of the system, and that means that you can consider energy in this case um, to be a product. So plus energy is a product. So now, when you think about it, if you're making it hotter, if you're increasing the, the temperature, you are adding more product. Well, that means you're adding more stuff on the right. That means it has to shift left. So that's left. Um, if you were to make this colder, um, for so if you were making this colder, that would be decreasing the amount of product. So you're pulling away product, which means you have too little product which means your top is too small, so that means that you need some of your reactants to turn into products in order for the K to stay constant. So for for colder, it's going to shift right. Um, that's that. Um, and then decreasing the volume of the container is interesting because um, decreasing the volume of this container changes the concentrations of each of these guys. You get the same number of particles initially, but it is changing the concentrations because you're dividing by a different number. Um, so if you decrease the volume of the container, you're squishing it. Um, and the side that you're squishing more is the side that has the m larger volume of gases. So on the left side here, you've got four moles of gas. On the right side, you've got two moles of gas. Um, so decreasing the volume of the container, which changes the concentrations of these guys, is going to squish it such that it shifts right. Um, and the, the other interesting thing, and this is a question that they'll throw at you because they want you to make sure, they want to make sure that you understand that the reason that decreasing the volume of the container changes the um, the equilibrium is because it's changing the concentration of these of these chemicals. If you add neon to this container, neon an inert gas, it's not going to react, it's not a reactant, it's not a product, it is going to increase the overall pressure in this container. That's fine. But what it's not going to do is change the concentrations of these guys. You're going to have the same concentration, it's the same size container, it's the same number of particles. So adding an inert gas does nothing. Nothing. Um, nothing. Yeah. Um, and adding a catalyst is another thing that they'll throw at you as kind of a curveball to see if you're paying attention. Um, we haven't really studied catalysts this year, but catalysts don't change where your equilibrium lies. All it does is it gets you there faster. Um, so a catalyst will make this reaction, um, if you if you set initial conditions and let it go, adding a catalyst will allow it to reach the equilibrium position more quickly, but it's the same equilibrium position. So it um, adding a catalyst does nothing in terms of shifting it left or right. 
Um, it will make the process go faster, but it's going to have the same equilibrium position, the same K and everything. Um, and a lot of the questions that you see about equilibrium are about Le Chatelier's principles. Cause so you have to understand everything that's going on with the, with the K and the equilibrium uh, position versus equilibrium concentrations and all of the math and stuff. And then a lot of the questions are, well, if you do this, does it go left or right? Um, so let's look at table 13.4, which is um, not open. Hang on a sec. So table 13.4, which is from the Zoomed All book. Um, if we look at that, they're showing shifts in the equilibrium position for this reaction here, which is from um, dinitrogen tetroxide to uh, nitrogen dioxide, two moles. This is this and the um, the synthesis of ammonia, um, the the Heb Haber process, are like the two most common um, equilibrium reactions that they use when when they're just giving you random problems. So just be familiar with these two. Um, so here we have 58 kilojoules plus N2O4 yields 2NO2, and they're saying which way is it going to shift? All right. So if you add N2O4, that's adding um, reactant, so it's going to go the other direction, so it's going to go to the right. Bing. If you add nitrogen dioxide, that's adding product, so it's going to go to the left. Bing. If you remove dinitrogen tetroxide, which is interesting, this is, um, uh, let's see, if you remove, it's not interesting until a minute from now, if you remove this, then you have less reactant, so it's going to shift left. Bing. If you remove NO2, for if you're removing your product, which is something that you would tend to do in industry. You would like gather up and take away your product. Um, which way is the reaction going to shift? There's less product, so it's going to shift right. Bing. That's really helpful because you take away your product, it makes more product. You take away your product, it makes more product. It's great. Adding helium, nothing. Because this is an inert gas, while it does increase the overall pressure, it's not changing the, the concentrations of these guys, so it has no effect on the equilibrium um, expression. Decreasing the container volume is going to squish it, so it's going to shift it to whichever side has fewer moles. That's going to be your reactants, so that's going to go left. Increasing it, the opposite, right. Um, and then temperature, that's going to deal with whether it's endothermic or exothermic. Here we have an input of energy, so this is endothermic. If you increase the temperature, that's more energy. That's more of this reactant. It's going to shift right. Bing. If you decrease the temperature, that's less energy. That's less reactant, so it's going to shift it left. Bing. All right. So this is actually not related to this question, but it fits on the paper better because it's next to it. Don't worry. All right. Here is, I think we're going to do 13, 14, and 15 because these are just left-right questions. All right, arsenic can be extracted from its ores by first reacting the ore with oxygen, which is called roasting, to form solid um, tetraarsenic hexoxide, which is then reduced using carbon in this reaction. AS406 plus 6C yields AS4 and 6CO. Notice these guys are solids. That's going to be important because they don't show up in the equilibrium expression. So you've only got a top and no bottom, so it's not really a top. Predict the reaction of the shift of the equilibrium position in response to each of the following changes in conditions. Adding carbon monoxide. Adding carbon monoxide. That is going to be... I need my pen. Um, addition of a product, so that's going to shift it left. Additional removal of carbon, or tetraarsenic hexoxide. Hey, I got that right. Um, adding these. These are solids. So adding more of them, it doesn't matter. You're not changing the concentrations of the guys that are showing up in your equilibrium expression. So that is nothing. And then removal of gaseous arsenic, so pulling away your product, um, that is going to shift it right. Bam. All right, 13.14. Predict the shift in equilibrium position that will occur with each of these when the volume is reduced. So. Here you've got this, a solid, a gas, and a liquid. The only one that matters is this guy. Um, volume is reduced. Well, that's going to squish this, so that's going to go right. Um, ha. 
And squishing this one, we've got one mole, two moles versus one moles. So squishing this one, that's more moles. You're going to go away from it because it counteracts it. So that's also going right. And then this one, you've got one mole and three moles, so four moles, one mole and three moles, so four moles. And so that's um, actually going to have no effect on the equilibrium position um, because it's neither one is a better situation for squishing. All right, 13.15. All right, for 13.15, you've all right for 13.15, you've got N2 and O2 yielding nitrogen monoxide, um, and this is an endothermic reaction. So this can be considered as a the energy can be considered as a reactant. So energy plus nitrogen and oxygen. Um, when you are making the temperature go up, that's going to be more reactants, which is going to shift it right. So that's going to shift this reaction to the right. When you shift this reaction to the right, that's going to increase the amount of products. Now, you're changing the temperature, so your K isn't going to be constant. Um, as you increase the amount of products, that's going to increase the top of your equilibrium expression, which makes your K go up. Um, and for this one, you've got this indicating an exothermic. So this is energy coming out. Um, as the temperature is increased with this, an exothermic reaction is actually not favorable. Um, so you're going to be shifting this to, let's see, as the temperature increases, you know, you're shifting it left. And as you shift it left, you're going to have more reactants, which are on the bottom. And when you have more bottom of a fraction, it gets smaller, so your K value will decrease. All right, last box. All right. <sighs> do you remember G? I hope you do. That's Gibbs free energy. Hopefully you were writing the word. Yes. Oh, or S. Yes. Yes, I remember G. What is it for? Um, because this formula here, delta G equals negative RT ln of K, um, is a link between the concepts of Gibbs free energy and um, the equilibrium expression and position. Um, so you have to remember what G is for for this to make sense. And if you remember, G is for predicting spontaneity, which is probably not spelled that way. Um, I don't think there's an A. That's okay, the computer doesn't think it's spelled that way either. Spontaneity. Um, if G is negative, you'll remember it is spontaneous. If G is positive, you'll remember that it is non-spontaneous. Um, it can be correlated with K. Um, there's a relationship between delta G and K that can be just sort of qualitative if you think about it carefully. Um, when delta G is negative, that's the best place to start. When delta G is negative, that means it's spontaneous. That means that the reaction is going forward. That means that you're going to have um, more products and fewer reactants. And so you end up with an equilibrium constant K that is greater than one because your top is big. So if it is spontaneous and goes forward, your K is greater than one. If your delta G is positive, that means that it's not spontaneous in the direction that it's written. It means that it is spontaneous in the direction that it's not written. Backwards. So in that case, it's not spontaneous going forwards. That means that your reactants are bigger. When your reactants are bigger, your K is less than 1. Right in between, at when your uh, delta G, your Gibbs free energy change, is 0, you'll remember that that's at equilibrium, where it's already balanced. That means that your K is already 1. Um, so qualitatively they make sense here and mathematically speaking quantitatively um, and yes you do have to use this formula um, your delta G at standard conditions um, is equal to negative RT ln of K um, it's important to know that this R is your energy related R um, and your energy related R is the 8.3145 and the units are joules per Kelvin moles and that means that our delta G which we have always previously calculated in kilojoules must be calculated in joules because otherwise these units don't cancel 
Um, so you remember how your delta H list in the back of your book is in kilojoules and your delta G list is in kilojoules and your entropy list is in joules? You're going to have to calculate your delta G in kilojoules when you get the go hit that uh, go hit that skunk equation and then convert it to joules to put it in here. Watch out. Um, so there's that. There's 8.3145. There's your Kelvins. And Mr. Moore assures me that you now know what this means. This makes me happy. Um, Ellen of K. This is uh, a nice little calculator button. It's right here. Dun, dun. It's related to logarithms. It's log base E, the natural log. Um, and E is that number 2.718. Um, so uh, let's go do an example of using this and then we'll be done. No, not there. Yes, there. All right, and if you remember back to thermodynamics, there was a little section that I said, don't do the last section because we don't know how to do it yet. Well, now we do because now we understand K and this is the linkage between G and K. Um, where's my pen? Do I have it? I do. Okay. The overall reaction for the corrosion of iron by oxygen is this dun 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 dun. Using the following data, calculate the equilibrium constant for this reaction at 25 degrees Celsius. Now, what have they given us? They've given us H and S. What do we do with H and S to get K? You gotta go use this. Do you remember this? Go hit that skunk. All right, so go hit that skunk. That means we're going to have to calculate our H and calculate our S and stick them in and get our G. So here we go. Um, the sum, remember the sum formulas? All right, so your delta H is the sum of all of your um, H's for your products minus the sum of all of your H's for your reactants. So your delta H of formation is no, your delta H is standard condition, whatever it is. This thing um, is for your products first. So two times, because there's two moles here in the balanced equation, two times this guy, negative 826 minus four times zero and three times zero. Near, near, near. So that's delta H is equal to equal to something. Where is it? Uh, whatever two times negative eight twenty six is. Um, negative sixteen fifty two. Negative sixteen fifty two kilojoules. All right. So that's our delta H. Now for our delta S. Our delta S is equal to same deal. All of our products, which is two times. There's our product, 90 minus 4 times 4 times 27 plus 3 times 205. And that gives you negative 543 joules per mole. That's negative 0 0.543 kilojoules per mole. All right, now you can stick these guys into the going, go hit that skunk equation. So delta G equals negative 1652 minus your temperature 25. That's your 298, your really common one. 298 times negative 0.543. That gives you a delta G equal to negative 1490.2 kilojoules. Convert that to joules in order to use it in our next equation. Negative 1490200 joules. That's a lot of joules. <clears throat> That's a lot of joules. I know it is, isn't it, Mr. Shark? All right, now we can use this equation, the one that we've just learned, delta G. Did you remember all that stuff from before? You should. Your final exam is coming. Dun, 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 dun. Um, equals negative R T L N of K. So your delta G, which is negative bajillion here, negative one four nine zero two zero zero equals negative eight point thirty one forty five times two ninety eight times L N of K, and that gives you L N of K 
is 601.4. This is sort of fun because um, in order to undo an ln, you've got to do e to the, so that's e to the 601.4th power equals what? This makes your calculator explode. It says overflow, which makes sense because if you're raising something to the 600th power, it gets really big. So I went and I asked the better calculators on the internet, um, and so overflow. I went and I asked the better calculators on the internet to actually give me the value of this. You could just leave it like this, honestly. Um, and it tells me that k, this is k by the way, k equals uh, 1.53 e to the 261st. Pretty great, huh? All right, that I believe is all, my friends. Oh, no, it's not all. We get to look at our celebratory giant isopod. I hope you knew about these animals, but if you didn't, they're awesome. Enjoy. <laughs>